What were some of the weirdest situations we covered in 2023? Let's get started with this marathon video. Who are the celebrities and the scammers they fell in love with? Let's find out, starting with... Number 5. Yep, the car is in the mail. Terence Kudzai Mushanga, who was, or maybe still is, since it seems like they're on again, off again, the boyfriend of South African actress Kanye Mbao. He scammed a Nigerian national out of a bunch of cash in an elaborate car scam. James Aliyu bought two cars from Mushanga, one of which was hijacked and the other stolen shortly after Aliyu took possession of the vehicle. Although Mushanga was a fugitive from Zimbabwe, he introduced himself to Aliyu as a South African named Dick Lefa Nzula. Yes. We agree. We thought that's as dumb of a made-up name as possible, too. Mushanga sold Aliyu a Mercedes and a Jaguar for 1.22 million South African Rand, which is roughly $63,000. Mushanga gave Aliyu copies of his driver's license, ID, and vehicle papers so that Aliyu could change the ownership and registration of the cars to his name. But when he got to his local DMV, Aliyu learned the documents were fake. Aliyu filed a police report for fraud against Mushanga and an additional report against the thieves who stole the cars. Aliyu believed that Mashanga intentionally orchestrated the thefts and that the criminals that had carried out the thefts worked for him. Mushanga refused to explain why he gave Aliyu a different name and said that even though he had over roughly 1 million US dollars in his bank account, he wasn't going to pay Aliyu back. Mushanga also accused Aliyu of being wanted by the FBI for scamming Americans out of thousands of dollars. He refused to give Aliyu any of his money back as the cash Aliyu used to pay Mashanga was the proceeds of a crime. As of the release of this video, there hasn't been a resolution to the case. It has to be weird to be dating a rich celebrity, but still feel like you need to run a scam. And it's not like he scammed all that much money to make the whole thing worth it. Number four, the real fraud of New Jersey. Reality TV personality Joe Judice ended his 41-month prison sentence for fraud by being deported to his home country, Italy. Teresa and Joe Judice Judice rose to fame on the Real Housewives of New Jersey, and their glamorous lifestyle and extravagant spending alarmed fans and co-stars. Their wealth seemed endless, until the public learned that the couple had overstated their income on loan applications and concealed the money they made from the Bravo hit reality show in a bankruptcy filing. According to their indictment, the Judices obtained millions of home-related loans between 2001 and 2008. They filed loan applications and provided supporting documents to lenders that stated that they had high-paying jobs when the truth was that neither was employed or receiving the high salaries they claimed. In 2001, Teresa applied for a $121,500 mortgage loan where she lied about being employed as an executive assistant and provided fake W-2 forms and pay stubs. She and Joe applied for another mortgage loan of $361,250 in 2005. They put it under Teresa's name and stated in the application that she was a realtor who made $15,000 a month despite being unemployed. The Judices filed for Chapter 7 bankruptcy protection in 2009. They intentionally concealed businesses they owned, rental property income, and anticipated income in the filings. By that point, Teresa was making a steady income from the Real Housewives of New Jersey, as well as with website sales and magazine and personal appearances. Although they knew they would have anticipated income from the upcoming second season of their reality show, Teresa and Joe testified under oath about the assets and income they reported in their filings. The couple were charged with bank fraud, conspiracy to commit mail and wire fraud, bankruptcy fraud, and making false statements on loan applications. The couple pleaded guilty in federal court to defrauding lenders of over $5 million when they submitted fraudulent documents for construction and bank loans and by lying to bankruptcy officials and withholding assets. Joe also pleaded guilty to one count of failure to file a tax return. Teresa and Joe had four young children and requested to serve their time in prison separately in order to care for them. Teresa received a 15-month prison sentence, then... At the end of her time behind bars, she returned to the family home and Joe reported to serve his sentence. Although Joe's parents and siblings had U.S. citizenship, Joe never got his. However, since he moved to the U.S. when he was only a year old, he considered himself to be an American. An immigration judge disagreed with his sentiment and ordered he be deported back to Italy. Teresa originally said she would move there with him, but shortly after he returned to his home country, the pair split. She remarried a few years later. Number 3. Bollywood Bungled 
Bollywood actress Sophia Hayat almost lost her three million pound London home when her boyfriend attempted to sign it over to his ex-wife. Hayat met the scammer after she took a career pivot to become a spiritual healer and spent 18 months at a nunnery. She left that to pursue her relationship with the man that was 15 years younger than her. It seems like Sophia was trying to find herself. Her now boyfriend asked to attend the meditation group that she held in her home and regularly sent her flowers, crystals, chocolates, and perfumes. The unnamed Romanian personal trainer also showered her with compliments about how much he respected her spirituality. The scammer returned to Romania to visit his son and returned with a gold necklace for Hayat. Catching feelings, Hayat asked if he wanted to move in with her and after three weeks of dating, the couple were sharing a home. Hayat wanted to marry her new partner but opted for a sacred union ceremony rather than a religious one. She gifted her husband a 20,000 pound Cartier ring and paid for the ceremony which cost 70,000 pounds. The elaborate event featured white horses, a string quartet, a harp player, and a jazz band. None of the con artist's friends or family attended, with him claiming that he stopped speaking to his father due to money disputes and didn't have any friends in England. Hayat funded most of their expenses and gave the pair a luxurious lifestyle with expensive vacations around the world. One day, Hayat went through her husband's phone and found that he was trying to sell two of her Rolexes. So of course, she freaks and immediately kicks him out of the house, but then allowed him to move back in a week later. Hayat suspected he was having financial troubles that he didn't want to tell her about, so she made some some excuses. He claimed that he stole the watches to pay for lawyers because his wife was seeking full-time custody of their son. He had offered to give him thousands of pounds to seek legal advice and even met the alleged lawyer on a trip to Romania. She had dinner with the lawyer's wife and children as well as her husband and his son. The lawyer said Hayat's partner was in a lot of trouble and it would be very expensive to get him out of it. The couple returned from Romania and jetted off to South America to participate in, eh, let's just call it, a guided spiritual journey with some special substance. Substances. Thanks, YouTube. During the experience, Haya asked her husband about the truth of what happened. He admitted that he was stealing money from her business, her safe, and that he was planning to steal her home with his ex-wife. He confessed that he took the deeds of the house from the safe and was hiding them in the back of his closet. This scammer also said that he was still in love with his ex-wife, prompting Haya to storm out of the ceremony and head back to London alone. Although he tried to tell her that what he said during the ceremony wasn't true, Haya found a bag in his closet that contained the deeds to her house, her passport, and her birth certificate. Busted! Since his ex-wife had the same hair color as Hayat, she believed that the plan was to have the ex-wife pretend to be her. Hayat found three pairs of her socks in her ex-partner's closet too, which she had been looking for. Whenever she mentioned them, he told her that she was becoming very forgetful. She had blood work done shortly after the relationship ended and discovered her cholesterol level was extremely high, despite her supposed healthy diet and lifestyle. Hayat discovered that the protein shakes he had been making her were loaded with fat. The only valuable item she could prove that he took was the Cartier ring, which she reported to the police, who closed the investigation after a month. Hayat said that after he got arrested for an unrelated theft, the alleged scammer fled the country and went to Romania. Number two, welcome to Scam Island. Sammy Kimmitz, a former stockbroker and boyfriend to British TV personality Danny Dyer from Love Island, defrauded two senior citizens out of $40,000. Kimmitz met 90-year-old Peter Martin and 80-year-old Peter Haynes while working working for Equine Global Sports Limited. But when it closed down, Kimmitz pretended to have moved to another company and continued to make bets on behalf of Martin and Haynes. But instead of placing the bets, Kimmitz used the money to pay the overdraft fees on his bank account and put the rest of the funds towards a luxury hotel stay in Ibiza, paying restaurant bills and buying clothes. Kimmitz also charged $1,600 on one of his victims' credit cards and withdrew over $1,500 using another one of their bank cards. He also convinced them to transfer money to his accounts with Martin sending $28,500 and Haynes transferring 10,000 bucks. Kimmins was arrested and charged with five counts of fraud. By his trial date, Martin had passed away and Haynes had Alzheimer's. The former financial advisor pleaded guilty to five counts of fraud and received a three and a half year prison sentence. Number one, Anne Hathaway and Raffaello Folieri. Early in her Hollywood career, A-list actress 
Grace Ann Hathaway dated disgraced businessman and scammer Raffaello Folieri. Hathaway was 21 when she met the 25-year-old Italian entrepreneur through a mutual friend. Although she was furious with Folieri for arriving an hour late to their first date, the Princess Diary star couldn't deny how attracted she was to the well-dressed Italian man. Folieri embodied the bad boy persona while dressing in expensive outfits and charming those around him with his charisma. Folieri studied law and economics at the University of Rome and opened his first company, Beauty Planet, in 1999. While Folieri claimed that Beauty Planet produced bulk hair and body care products and was extremely successful, it operated at a loss for almost its entire existence, and most checks the company wrote bounced. Folieri ended up liquidating his 50% share for roughly $8,000 three years into its existence. So, he decided to start a new life in New York City, where he turned his sights on the real estate market. Despite not speaking very much English, he founded the Folieri Group with his father. Folieri appointed himself as chairman and CEO of the Folieri Group and made his father president. The language barrier didn't stop the businessman from making important connections in the Big Apple, including real estate investor Vincent Ponte. Folieri appointed Ponte as the Folieri Group's vice president, despite his criminal business contacts, Folieri positioned himself as an emissary of the Vatican. He claimed he was the church's man from Rome. The Folieri Group worked on several projects with the Catholic Church in New York. In 2004, the Catholic Church faced one of its biggest crises in its history with the publication of a report about the misdeeds of priests and deacons in the U.S. After a flood of lawsuits, the church paid out almost $2 billion in settlement payments. Having suffered massive financial losses, the institution had to sell some of its property holdings to recover. The Folieri Group was there to assist with selling the properties and promised to sell the buildings to companies that planned on using them in socially responsible manners consistent with the church's ideals. The real estate company also said that it would share a percentage of the profits with the Vatican and its nonprofit, the Folieri Foundation. When Folieri wasn't negotiating business deals or working for the church, he was with Hathaway. He frequently invited her to his penthouse at Trump Tower, cooked her favorite dishes, took her on a private tour of the Vatican and its gardens, and regularly flew her out to Italy. In 2005, Folieri's personal and professional lives were thriving. He met Doug Band, an aide to former President Bill Clinton. Band introduced Folieri to key figures such as Canadian real estate developer Michael Cooper, billionaire Ron Burkle, and Band's former boss, Bill Clinton. Burkle and Folieri formed Folieri Ukepa Investments, a joint venture that developed unused Catholic properties with Burkle pledging $105 million to the cause. Folieri was more focused on networking with Clinton and donated $1 million to the Clinton Global Initiative, putting him on the former president's radar and earning him an invitation to vacation with one of the world's most influential people. Hathaway and Folieri went to the Dominican Republic with the Clintons, but behind the scenes, Folieri's were falling apart. Burkle sued Folieri for misappropriating $1.3 million, and the billionaire alleged in the suit that his money paid for Folieri's $40,000 a month apartment, private chef, and luxury travel. The filing claimed that Folieri ran up the balance of the company's three credit cards and diverted hundreds of thousands of dollars from Folieri Ukepa Investments to his charity, the Folieri Foundation. Folieri's next lawsuit came from the Carmen Group, a public relations firm that the Folieri Group employed but failed to pay its $240,000 tab. A judge ordered that he pay the firm $250,000. News broke that Folieri paid Doug Band 40000 bucks to be introduced to Bill Clinton, prompting the former president to disown him. A spokesperson to the former president went on record to say that Clinton barely knew Folieri. Folieri Group's projects also came under intense scrutiny, including its handling of the church properties it vowed to sell. Although the company alleged it entered into contracts to acquire $100 million of church property, it only acquired a few properties, which either fell into disrepair or were sold for little profit. The property sale should have helped provide financial support to the Folieri Foundation, but that money never came, prompting the foundation to rely on other sources of income, including support from Hathaway, who was a board member at the time. Folieri's legal and financial issues continued to mount when a private jet company sued Folieri for half a million dollars for unpaid air travel between 2006 and 2007. While Folieri was at his Fifth Avenue apartment, NYPD officers arrested him in front of Hathaway.
Hathaway for writing a bad check of $215,000 to real estate developer John Morangiello. At the time, Foliari only had $39 in his bank account. Hathaway tearfully watched officials lead Foliari out of the building. Friends and family members allegedly warned the actress Foliari wasn't who he said he was. But it wasn't until the truth about the Foliari Foundation's business dealings came to light that she began to publicly separate herself from her disgraced boyfriend. Then, Attorney General Andrew Cuomo launched an investigation into Foliari's nonprofit, prompting Hathaway's publicist to announce that Hathaway was no longer a board member of the foundation. Breakup rumors surrounded the couple, but the pair supposedly only split for a few weeks before getting back together. Federal authorities arrested Foliari in Manhattan for wire fraud, conspiracy, and money laundering charges. An FBI investigation uncovered that Foliari had wired almost $1 million to an account in Monaco to conceal control and location of the funds. He also lied to investors about being the CFO of the Vatican to purchase church properties below fair market value. He swindled six million bucks from real estate investors while posing as a top official at the Vatican. Foliari pleaded guilty and spent five years behind bars. He was deported to Italy upon release and banned from entering the U.S. The last time Hathaway admitted to speaking to Foliari was the night before his arrest. She cut off all contact with him the next day. What are some of the weirdest places cash was found? Let's get started with... Number five, the storage safe. In a stroke of incredible luck, an unnamed buyer of a storage unit purchased from Storage Wars star Dan Dotson stumbled upon a remarkable find that forever changed their life. Dan Dotson, an auctioneer and co-star of the popular a and &E show Storage Wars, has been running the successful American auctioneer since 1974. He's an expert in auctioning off unclaimed and abandoned storage lockers. The buyer purchased a storage unit for 500 bucks, which had a safe inside. It's common to find safes in storage units, but they're almost always empty. This is one of those almost always times. The buyer cracked the safe and discovered seven and a half million dollars inside. News of the discovery reached the original owners of the unit. Seeking to reclaim their lost fortune, they reached out to the new owner through their lawyer. And that's the thing with our personal information all over the web. The old owner's lawyer most likely was able to easily find the new owner's information because most people's data is all over the internet. And that's where our sponsor for today's video, Incogni, comes in. You're able to say goodbye to intrusive ads, spam emails, and data breaches with Incogni. Incogni is a revolutionary service that puts you back in control of your data by proactively contacting data brokers on your behalf demanding the removal of your personal information from their databases. Say you signed up for a free newsletter, for example, only to be bombarded with spam from unknown senders. With Incogni, bid farewell to unwanted emails and restore peace to your inbox. Their expert team will swiftly reach out to data brokers ensuring your personal information is scrubbed from their databases to prevent further spam intrusions. Or after researching a medical case, you suddenly find yourself bombarded with ads and promotions from services you've never visited. Don't let your browsing history dictate your online experience and let Incogni step in to protect your privacy by removing your personal data from data brokers, giving you the freedom to browse without being haunted by irrelevant ads. Stop being a victim of privacy invasion. With Incogni, your personal information stays where it belongs, with you. Secure your digital footprint by clicking on the link in the description below and the first 100 people get 60% off by using the promo code Pablito. Now, let's get back to finding out what the original owners of the unit offered to the new owners. The original owners offered $600,000 to the fortunate buyer as a reward for returning the rest of the money. After some negotiations, the original owners increased their offer to an impressive $1.2 million. After some consideration, the new owners decided to accept the offer put forth by the original owners. This decision meant they would walk away with a generous sum of $1.2 million, marking an extraordinary return on their humble $500 investment. Dotson, reflecting on the situation, expressed his understanding and support for the buyer's choice. Considering the substantial amount of money involved, Dotson recognized the challenges and risks of handling such an enormous sum. 
He also hinted at potential concerns surrounding the legitimacy of the money in the safe, which might have influenced the buyer's decision to accept the reduced offer. The buyer was pretty smart, because if movies have taught us anything, it's that money found in a safe isn't always safe. Number four, House of Money. Spanish man, Tono Pinero, made a surprising discovery in the walls of his new home. Pinero was remodeling his new home when he discovered canisters filled with cash in the walls. The former Spanish currency he found was roughly 9 million pesetas, which amounted to roughly $58,000 in value. It had been sitting in Nesquik cans for years. Unfortunately, most of the pesetas were no longer accepted by the Bank of Spain, as those versions were phased out in 2002. The banks had offered a deadline to exchange in update the currency, but Pinero came upon the stash far beyond the exchange date. Since he couldn't spend the money, Pinero decided to trade and sell as much as possible to collectors. He managed to sell enough to pay for a new roof for his property. Before Pinero purchased the property, it had been uninhabited and neglected for four decades. A prolonged period of abandonment suggests that the previous owner, Manuel de Zentes, had hid his fortune in the house's walls before the house was vacated. Zentes worked at a local brick factory and was a cattle dealer. According to his old neighbors, he used to store his cash in farm machinery. When he sold the machinery, he must have moved his money into the walls, having accumulated significant wealth over time. After his story received media attention, an architect named Pepe Cruz expressed interest in acquiring part of the trove of banknotes. Cruz was particularly interested in the six models of the series of 200, 500, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, and 10,000 pesetas, which were originally designed by his father, Jose Maria Cruz Novillo. Cruz's father had bought banknotes from the first batch issued by the Bank of Spain, but many of them were stolen in the 1990s or damaged by humidity. Cruz wanted to recover these banknotes as an archive fund for their studio. Number 3. Operation Venetic in July 2020, Operation Venetic dismantled organized crime groups utilizing EncroCat, a secure mobile phone instant messaging service used to coordinate illegal activities. EncroChat was one of the largest encrypted communications providers and had roughly 60,000 users worldwide, with 10,000 of them living in the UK. The service allowed criminals to coordinate the distribution of illicit commodities, engage in money laundering, and plan retaliations against rival criminal gangs. Operation Venetic confiscated 65 million dollars in cash, two tons of class A and class B substances, 28 million unprescribed pills, 55 high value cars, and 73 luxury watches, as well as an entire arsenal of firearms. EncroChat offered encrypted information channels where evildoers could exchange messages securely. The phones came preloaded with apps that enable voice over internet protocol calls and instant messages. The devices also had a functionality that allowed users to wipe the data on on their devices remotely. However, the phones had no other smartphone functionality and cost users $1,850 for a six-month contract because apparently even criminals can't escape contracts. French and Dutch law enforcement played a crucial role in bringing down EncroChat. They hacked the system and accessed all the messages and communications related to drug and arms deals. Authorities shared this information with other law enforcement agencies and analyzed millions of messages and hundreds of thousands of images. They used this information to identify EncroChat's users, including middle tier and upper echelon criminals, kingpins, or organized crime gangs. When French authorities discovered EncroChat servers, the communication company realized a breach in their system. It urged users to dispose of their phones, which were expensive and only worked with other EncroChat devices. With the help of European law enforcement, British police conducted seizures across the country where they obtained more luxury items, money, and illegal goods. The value of all the items and cash they seized was over $91 million, with a single raid yielding $8 million, bucks, the largest in Scotland Yard history. Additionally, the information extracted from EncroChat allowed a specialist team with the National Crime Agency to prevent kidnappings and retaliations planned by rival gangs, mitigating 200 threats to people's lives. Over 700 people were arrested because of Operation Venetic. Number 2. Money in Music 
Piano tuner Martin Backhouse made a surprising discovery while cleaning a piano. Underneath the keys was a hidden cache of gold coins that dated back as far as 1847. The piano's owners, Graham and Meg Hemmings, were unaware of the 913 coins inside the instrument for the 33 years they owned it. The Hemmings used the instrument to teach their children how to play the piano during the 1980s. The piano played well enough for teaching purposes, and the coins seemed to have no effect on the sound. The couple donated the piano to a local school, and since they weren't the legal owners at the time of the discovery, they weren't entitled to any portion of the fine. The funds were divided between Backhouse and Bishop's Castle College in England. The college hired Backhouse to tune the piano, which it appears made him entitled to a share. The coins needed to be valued by the Treasure Valuation Committee to determine their worth in today's money. The face value of the coins was £773 back then, which would be the equivalent of roughly half a million pounds in today's money. Although Graham and Meg Hemmings saw no issue with the piano sound, Backhouse immediately knew something was off with the keys. Backhouse discovered the 913 coins while working on the piano. He'd noticed that some of the keys were stiff and decided to investigate further. So he removed the keys and found something underneath the keyboard. Initially, he thought it might be moth repellent, but upon touching it, realized it was something different. Backhouse lifted a cloth package and was surprised by its weight. He examined the package closely and noticed that it was well stitched. Using a pen knife, Backhouse opened it and found what appeared to be gold coins inside. He didn't examine all of them, but knew he'd made a significant discovery as they seemed to be very old. He recognized the significant significance of his find and reported it to the school authorities. The piano's original owners expressed their contentment with the outcome and had no expectations of receiving any financial benefit from the find. Graham Hemmings, a retired finance director, stated they were happy that the school would benefit from the coins. They were glad to know that the piano would be used for a good cause. The coins belonged to the button coinage of the British Empire, meaning they weren't exceptionally rare. However, the significance of the find lay in the size of the hoard, and it was the largest ever saw sovereign hoard discovered in Britain. While the exact results of the split isn't publicly known, the money would likely be life-changing for Backhouse, as well as improving Bishop's Castle College's educational endeavors. Backhouse planned to use the money to retire early to spend his time contributing to the church. Number 1. Buried Treasure while excavating their backyard, Suzanne and Richard Gilson discovered a hidden treasure in their New Jersey lawn. The couple was in the process of renovating their 1920s cottage when they came across two cylindrical objects in the backyard. They had initially cast the cylinders aside as thinking they were weeds. Upon closer inspection, Richard realized they were tightly rolled wads of old $10 and $20 bills, amounting to $1,000 worth $20,000 in today's money. The bills were all marked as being printed in 1934, which Richard found odd as typically bills have different printed dates unless someone gets brand new ones the couple believe that someone intentionally obtained new bills rolled them up and placed them in jars for hiding there were many theories about where the money could have come from richard originally believed it was obtained through shady means but later suggested that a person who lost faith in banks might have buried the cash the person may have believed their money was safer in the ground where they could access it directly when necessary being in new jersey richard was lucky it was only money he found digging up his yard a tight bundle suggested that the person panicked and rolled them up very tightly. $100 worth of $10 bills was rolled up so tightly it was smaller than the diameter of a cigarette. Richard enjoyed the afternoon from the story. Neighbors he didn't know exited stopped by and he welcomed a widespread media attention. Despite the potential monetary value of the money, he didn't really care about profiting from it. He said the story was worth more than him, than the financial gain, and that even if the funds were worth double their estimated value, I wouldn't change his perspective. Where are some of the weirdest and most interesting ways cash is found? Let's get right into it, starting with number five, heavy bags. In June 2020, the Metropolitan Police in London accidentally stumbled upon the mother load of dirty cash. 5.1 million pounds stuffed under beds, in cupboards, and just casually dumped on the floor of a Fulham flat in the UK. The money launderers behind the stash were so flustered by lockdown restrictions that they didn't know what to do with all the cash, so they just left it lying around like a bunch of lazy bums. We would have made a cool fort or something. You don't get many opportunities in life to make a money fort. 
The money was found when undercover officers spotted Ruslan Shamsutinov, 36, struggling to put heavy bags into a car outside the luxury Porteous apartments. The bags contained cash linked to Sergis Ausens, a Russian middleman working for gun and drug syndicates across London. When the police raided the flat, they found stacks of cash everywhere they looked, under the beds and cupboards and on the floor. It was like they were raiding the house of some wealthy old lady who doesn't trust banks because they're all crooks. The money laundering hub was being used by at least 10 different criminal gangs and they were all unable to clean their dirty money due to the lockdown restrictions. In total, the police seized 5 million and 82,000 pounds along with 39,000 euro and 8,000 pounds that were discovered at Shemshudanov's home in Hackney. Five weeks later, the police observed another accomplice, Sirwin Ahmadi, handing over a bag of cash to a fourth suspect in North London. Within hours, Ahmadi was arrested along with 59,980 pounds and a search of his home in Pycroft Way uncovered an additional 198,600 pounds. The following day, Ausens was detained at his house in Rochester, where the police found another 14,435 pounds, bringing the total to nearly 5.4 million pounds. The three money launderers, Shemshudinov, Ausens, and Amadi, were jailed and sentenced for their crimes. Shemshudinov was jailed for three years and nine months. Ausens was sentenced to three years and four months, and Amadi received a suspended sentence after pleading guilty to conspiracy to conceal and disguise criminal property. The seized cash will eventually be used to fund operations by the Metropolitan Police and the Home Office to tackle violent crime. Number four, another man's trash. It was a typical Saturday afternoon for the Shantz family as they went for a leisurely drive through the streets of Caroline County. Little did they know, their day was about to take a wild turn. As they were driving down Broad Street, they noticed the car in front of them swerving around an object in the road. Without time to react, Mrs. Shantz hit the object, which turned out to be a bag. The family, thinking it was just some trash that had been left on the side of the road and being generally good people, pulled over to collect the bag so it could be disposed of properly. But fate had other plans for the Shantz family. As they were driving, they spotted another bag on the side of the road, just 15 feet away from the first one. Mrs. Shantz, reflexes on high alert this time, stopped the car and picked up the second bag. Little did the Shantz family know, but they had just stumbled upon almost $1 million in cold, hard cash. After making this shocking discovery, the Shantz family called the Caroline deputies to report their findings. The deputies arrived on the scene and determined that the bags of money had likely belonged to the Postal Service and were intended for a bank. But how they ended up on the side of the road remains a mystery. Despite the temptation to keep the money for themselves, the Shantz family did the right thing and returned the money to the authorities. They probably had seen enough movies to know that keeping bags of money found on the side of the road never works out. Major Scott Moser paid the family a visit on Monday to thank them for their honesty. In repayment for giving back almost a million dollars, he put his police lights on for their two sons. We're sure the kids were polite enough to hide their disappointment. The Shantz family may not have gotten to keep the bags of money, but they can rest easy knowing that they did the right thing. And who knows, maybe they'll get a nice reward for their good deed. Also, they don't need to worry about Anton Chigar. Number three, forever money. Meet Archie Cabello, the black sheep of the Cabello family and a career criminal. Born and raised in Detroit, Michigan, Cabello always had a penchant for getting into trouble. In 1995, Archie Cabello was living a quiet life in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, working as an armed courier who delivered money to banks and businesses all over town. But little did anyone know, he had a plan that would change his family's life forever. Using his wife and son as accomplices, Cabello stole nearly $4 million from 1995 to 2005. It was a crime that left authorities in two states scratching their heads for over a decade. But because nothing comes between Uncle Sam and his cut, the IRS got involved. They discovered a suspicious paper trail leading to Cabello's son, Vincent, who ended up confessing. In 1995, at the age of 48, Cabello was working for an armed delivery services company when he decided to plan another robbery. He was working with two other couriers, one of whom had only been on the job for a week, while the other had only been there for two weeks. As the veteran, Cabello was afforded the leeway 
way to do sketchy things and not be questioned by the rookie. For several days leading up to the robbery, Cabello and his wife practiced their routine. She would leave her job at a local cafe, seemingly on a lunch break, and drive around town. When she saw Cabello's armored truck drive by, she would park the car and wait for him to make a stop at a bank. On the day of the robbery, Cabello hit the hazard lights on the truck and his wife followed him to the strip mall where he was scheduled to make a stop at a bank. He signed for a bag containing about $157,000 and then pulled the truck around to the back of the bank where his wife was waiting in her car. He tossed the bag into her open window and they both drove off. When his bosses asked Cabello what happened to the money, he claimed he didn't know. The other two couriers who had no idea about the robbery also said they didn't know what happened. Cabello was fired and the Milwaukee police and the FBI investigated the incident. But they were unable to find any suspects or stolen money. Two years after the first robbery, Cabello's son Vincent was honorably discharged from the U.S. Army after serving as a paratrooper. His father then roped him into committing a second heist. Vincent had gotten a job at a security corporation in the Milwaukee area, guarding the night vault in the basement of a commercial building. Vincent worshipped his father and felt trapped into going along with the robbery plan. Cabello showed up wearing a bushy beard, a backwards baseball hat, and yellow tinted sunglasses armed with a BB gun. Vincent had closed the vault door, but purposely didn't spin the dial to lock it. After Cabello entered the building, the father and son team put on a big performance for the security cameras. Cabello pretended to be a robber and yelled, freeze, while Vincent complied, seemingly unaware of the plan. Cabello handcuffed his son and went into the vault, stealing $730,000. The detective questioning Vincent, Ron Laura, became suspicious of Vincent's lack of reaction to the robbery and began to think it might have been an inside job. But without any probable cause, he was unable to make an arrest. A year after the second Milwaukee heist, the Cabello family moved to Portland, Oregon. By 1999, he had moved 21 times in four years, always staying in rented houses and apartments to avoid suspicion. But their money was about to run dry, and by 2005, Archie had a good financial plan. The plan was mainly stealing more money, but it was still a plan. Archie had been working for another armored delivery services company in Portland for about 10 months when he faked another armed robbery. He claimed that a gunman had approached his truck and forced him to drive to a nearby church, where he was found handcuffed to the door by a passerby. Over $7 million was on the truck that day, and two shrink wrap bricks containing $1.5 million each in $100 bills were missing. Authorities were suspicious of Cabello's story from the start. They noted that the truck was designed to withstand pistol rounds, so it was unlikely that a gunman could have forced Cabello to open the door. Four days after the supposed robbery, the FBI searched Cabello's home and found more than 100 credit cards and 620 money order receipts, but no stolen cash. An investigation revealed that the Cabellos had spent over a quarter million dollars on the credit cards, despite Archie earning only $44,000 in legitimate income in the four years following the robbery. Unfortunately for the Cabellos, the IRS became involved with the investigation and discovered a suspicious paper trail. The Cabellos had used the stolen money to buy several properties properties in the Portland area. The IRS was able to connect the properties to the Cabellos and their involvement in the robberies. In the annals of criminal history, there are many tales of elaborate heists and clever schemes that have been brought down by simple mistakes, such as the case of the Cabello crime empire, which was brought crashing down by one fateful Hummer purchase. Vincent Cabello, loyal son and accomplice to his father's criminal activities, made the mistake of purchasing a Hummer in cash, which was the last bit of evidence the IRS needed. The Cabellos were arrested and charged with theft and conspiracy. In a stroke of pure bad luck for the Cabello family, they were arrested just four days before the statute of limitations expired on their criminal activities. But it wasn't just their poor timing that led to their downfall. It turns out that Vincent, the loyal son who had helped his father pull off the two heists, had turned snitch. It was never really clear why Vincent ratted on his own father, but the investigators held the belief that many years of guilt were weighing him down, the weight only a Hummer could have supported. The Cabellos were brought to trial and sentenced in 2013. Despite the overwhelming evidence against them, Archie Cabello decided to act as his own attorney, believing he could outsmart the prosecution and the judge. But things didn't go as planned for Cabello. His lack of legal knowledge and experience proved to be a major hindrance, and he struggled to present a coherent defense. The prosecution, on the other hand, was able to paint a clear and damning picture of the Cabello family's involvement in the robberies. In the end, the jury found the Cabellos guilty 
On all counts, after only a few hours' deliberation, Archie Cabello was sentenced to 20 years in prison. His wife, Marion, received a measly 15-month sentence. And poor Vincent, who had cooperated with the authorities and provided key information in the investigation, was sentenced to 15 months in prison as well. It was a harsh lesson for the family and a reminder that acting as your own attorney isn't always the best idea. Crime may pay in the short term, but it's never a good idea to mess with the IRS. Number two, scammers gone a scam. Justin Colley is a plumber in Houston, Texas, and he made a shocking discovery while working on a bathroom at Joel Osteen's Lakewood Church. He stumbled upon hundreds of envelopes containing cash and checks hidden in a wall. The money is believed to have been stolen from the church's safe seven years ago in a burglary that robbed the megachurch of over $600,000. The robbery case went cold for seven years, but the church's insurance company was able to fully reimburse the stolen funds. However, it seemed that the thief was never caught in the stolen money was never recovered until Collie stumbled upon it while working on the bathroom wall. Collie immediately notified his supervisor and the authorities about his discovery rather than just pocketing the money and having nice dinners like all these scammers seem to enjoy doing. However, despite his honesty and good deed, Osteen didn't even acknowledge Collie. We guess the old saying is true. Virtue is its own reward. Fortunately for Cully, Crime Stoppers of Houston gave him an actual reward, in addition to the virtue thing, $20,000. It just goes to show that honesty really is the best policy. Unless you're sick, then health insurance is the best policy. And who knows, maybe Cully's newfound wealth will be enough to buy him a little recognition from Osteen. The church hasn't commented on the amount of money found in the wall, but we can only imagine the look on Osteen's face when he heard the news. It's not every day that someone finds a hidden stash of cash in a bathroom wall, and it's even rarer for that someone to be a plumber on a routine maintenance job. Osteen probably had the same expression he gives when he prays to Jesus for more money from his followers. The investigation into the 2014 burglary still isn't officially closed yet, but it seems that Cully's discovery may help provide some answers. John Cannon, a spokesman of the Houston Police Department, said that the cash, checks, and money orders found in the wall definitely do appear to be connected to the burglary. In the meantime, Cully is enjoying his newfound wealth and is no doubt grateful for the unexpected windfall. Number one, millions of yuan. Chinese police stumbled upon a hidden fortune of over 64 million yuan in cash while investigating a suspected fraud scam. The mind-boggling discovery was made during a raid on a flat in Jilin province, where officers found the staggering cash of money hidden behind a wall. The investigation began after the authorities received a tip-off about a fertilizing company called Shuang Fei, which was allegedly buying off the debts of individuals and small enterprises at a low price, but failing to repay them. Acting on this information, the Song Wen police set up a criminal investigation team and began tracking a man named Wei, the company's legal representative. After following Wei's movements and scrutinizing the company's cash flow, the police finally decided to raid the flat where they suspected the money was hidden. And they weren't disappointed. When they tore down the wall, they were greeted with an impressive sight. Millions upon millions of Chinese Yuan notes filling up the corners of the room and scattered haphazardly in the middle. In total, the police seized over 65 4 million yuan, which is equivalent to roughly 9.2 million bucks. Wei and three other suspects were arrested and detained for further investigation. The news of the incredible discovery quickly spread on Chinese social media, with many users expressing shock and disbelief at the sheer amount of money involved. Some even joked that the authorities should have left a little bit for everyone else, while others wondered what on earth Wei and his accomplices could have been planning to do with all that cash. One thing is for certain, this is definitely not your average case of fraud. It's a tale of greed, deception, and hidden riches that would make even Scrooge McDuck envious. It sounds like this safe house was cracked. Brian Newell, a manager at one of Garda World's armored truck branches, was given a bizarre order in 2018 to load all the coins stored at his facility in Connecticut onto a truck bound for Massachusetts. Auditors from Bank of America were taking a trip to Garda World's Massachusetts location to count money that Garda was being paid to protect, and some of it was missing. Garda is well known for their armored trucks that move money from place to place, but they are also in the business of storing and protecting money in vaults for U.S. banks. After about eight years of operation, Garda became an industry leader, holding money for some of the largest banks in the world. Garda's U.S. operations 
doesn't publish a client list, but it has been determined that they have held money for J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, PNC Bank, and TD Bank. The company also stores money for the Federal Reserve. Garda is a Canada-based company, but has grown far into the U.S. and beyond. They consistently post strong operating margins that have allowed it to attract investors and grow rapidly. In just 15 years, Garda has increased its annual revenue from under $200 million to $2.7 billion. As Garda skyrocketed into the industry, a Tampa Bay Times investigation uncovered deception at the core of Garda deep within their vaults. The investigation found that Garda's vaults had lost millions of dollars and concealed the missing money from the banks that hired them. It was found that some of the vaults even lacked basic safeguards, which gave way to unsolved thefts and an overall chaotic atmosphere. Brian Newell's Garda branch in Connecticut was a small location, only holding some $20,000 belonging to Bank of America and two other banks, and he sent every single coin of that $20,000 to Massachusetts. After the coins had arrived in Massachusetts, Newell learned that it hadn't been enough. There was a major money shortage at the Massachusetts branch, even after several other New England branches had also sent money. Garda sends banks a daily accounting of their balance in each vault, so any discrepancy should have been reported long before high levels of money vanished. However, company documents from 2014 revealed that Garda executives were well aware of the missing money. The 2014 document estimated roughly $9 million were missing, and we can assume Garda's response wasn't urgent as the case continued to build up until 2018. In 2015, email records show that Garda employees discussed how to keep TD Bank from discovering that a single Garda branch was missing $924,000 of the bank's money. With employees being fully aware that money was magically vanishing, honesty wasn't at the forefront of the company's values. In 2017 and 2018, employees at a St. Louis Garda branch hurriedly stalled bank auditors in a conference room while workers rushed to move boxes of of quarters and dimes, each containing hundreds of dollars from one bank's account to another. The auditors were then presented with the number of coins they expected, but they were actually looking at another bank's funds. Newell said that Garda employees would have bamboozled the auditors since they had no clue where the correct money was. Newell was eventually terminated from his position as manager at the Stratford branch in 2019 after complaining about safety problems. Newell's termination goes to show how severe the deception was at Garda, but Garda remained un willing to admit fault. The company claims that any discrepancies detected were quickly investigated, reported, and resolved, and that inventory reconciliation is a normal part of business for a cash vault operation. Despite Garda's clear mismatching between words and actions, they have become a global private security powerhouse, taking on important roles that extend outside the U.S. currency system. The company has branched into other divisions, providing college campus securities and carrying out sensitive defense contracts, such as protecting the U.S. Embassy in Afghanistan. With money protection and holding comes the well-known Garda Armored Truck Empire. This aspect of the company is operated out of Boca Raton, Florida, shuttling money between businesses and Garda vaults across the state of Florida. But as with other branches of Garda, there are indications that the company's rapid growth came at the expense of basic safeguards that are the norm at other companies. In March, it was revealed that the armored truck business was taking shortcuts on truck maintenance and training. Trucks lacked reliable brake systems, seatbelts, or even seats. Hundreds of people have been injured in Garda truck crashes and at least 19 have been killed at the expense of these safety shortcuts. In as little as three months, sometimes it's not just crashes. Sometimes it's simple human error. For example, back in November of 2021, a Sectron security armored truck's doors somehow popped open as it was going down I-5 in California. The cash, which was mostly $1 and $5 bills, flew out of the back of the truck and drivers actually stopped and actively lanes of traffic to scoop up the lost money. There were three fatal crashes due to mechanical failures or driver error. Now, obviously, employee theft isn't the only thing armored truck companies have to worry about. Back in October of 2019, Brinks's armored truck driver, Sabrina Gimeno, was making a delivery to a bank in Colorado when three men ambushed her during a heist. The robbers took over 
$100,000 in cash and totally terrified Jimeno. Interestingly, just days later, Brinks fired her despite her being with the company for seven years. Brinks claimed that they had protocols in place and that Jimeno didn't follow their protocols. Joseph James, vice president of finance at Garda's U.S. branch from 2013 to 2015, confirmed two employees' statements that said the company attempted to conceal both the fallout of its safety problems as well as the issues in the vaults. The employees also stated that they were told to manipulate financial records to minimize the potential costs of the armored truck wrecks and increase the company's value. James said that many of Garda's practices made him highly uncomfortable and that Garda's approach to handling money created problems big enough to undermine the premise of the business. In December 2013, Garda struck a deal with Bank of America that helped it jump to the top of the vault industry. Bank of America signed a 12-year deal agreeing to outsource many of its vaults to Garda, selling about 32 buildings and essentially loaning 1,000 employees to Garda's vault operation. Both Garda and Bank of America celebrated the deal, with Garda instantly doubling its vault business and Bank of America reducing overhead costs. But as Garda publicly announced their successes, executives in charge of expansion were discovering millions of dollars had gone missing, and the company had no idea where the money had run off to. Shelley Crandall had been hired to oversee Garda's vault several months before the Bank of America deal was finalized, and she later began to uncover that multiple locations were missing money. Patrick Prince, the chief financial officer for Garda's operations across the world and second in command to Garda's founder and CEO, gave Crandall the approval to investigate. After about nine Nine months of Crandall's investigations, she found that roughly $9 million was missing across Garda's vaults. Some losses had existed for more than two years, insinuating a complete lack of care on the company's part. Crandall created an official document detailing the extent of the losses, asking for the employees responsible to be held accountable, and urging the company to replace the money. The document's requests for actions were largely ignored by Garda, and vault managers continued to deceive auditors by showing the money for a specific account that actually belonged to another bank. Meanwhile, theft continued to occur in Garda's vaults. Footage from vault security cameras were of such poor quality that it looked like the lenses were covered in frost. To make matters worse, the Garda checks on vaults were so disorganized and infrequent that they often didn't realize money had gone missing until a client pointed it out. In another instance, Garda lost $76,000 during a delivery in Springfield, Massachusetts. The company was seemingly aware that the money had disappeared, but they didn't investigate until a month later. They accused two employees of stealing the money, but the video footage they presented to the courts were so poor that they were unable to prove anything. A judge dismissed all charges against the employees. In the same Springfield, Massachusetts branch, theft was a major issue. One employee was accused of stealing money that she had stuffed in her bra and shoes. Another slowly racked up $30,000 of loot over a three-month period, taking it little by little. A third employee admitted that he was left alone with open bags of money, that the temptation was too strong, and he stole somewhere around $71,000. $1,900. Even more than having dishonest employees, Garda as a company was sloppy. They didn't run routine checks or have security measures in place to prevent theft from occurring. In fact, three money bags containing a whopping $390,000 vanished off a Garda armored truck in 2013. Garda couldn't figure out where the money went until an ex-employee began spending lavishly in Las Vegas and turned up at the bank with a shoebox stuffed full of cash. The ex-employee was ultimately convicted of money laundering and the transportation of stolen money in connection with the crime. Federal prosecutors were unable to charge the employee with actually stealing the cash, in part due to the lack of visual evidence as there was no camera coverage. At the trial, a former Garda employee testified that Garda truck doors could be popped open with a broom handle, a trick many employees caught onto, and the trucks were often left unattended. Sometimes it's not just crashes, sometimes it's simple human error. For example, back in November of 2021, a Sectron Security armored truck's door somehow popped open as it was going down I-5 in California. The cash, which was mostly $1 and $5 bills, flew out of the back of the truck and drivers actually stopped in active lanes of traffic to scoop up the lost money. To the surprise of many, Garda did have money handling policies in place. For one, Garda armored trucks were never supposed to be left unattended, although we know that policy was followed loosely at best. Additionally, company rules stated that employees couldn't leave work for the night until every bill and coin was accounted for, but it's obvious that policy was ignored. External detectives 
Williams testified that Garda employees regularly didn't follow money handling policies as they dealt with multiple other unsolved Garda thefts at the same time. Each Garda branch had its own unique handful of issues, but across the company, broken down equipment and lack of protocols were regular problems that made it easy to lose track of cash. One employee said that he would be stressing out about thousands of dollars missing, but no one else was. If there was a shortage or an overage, it was no big deal because it happened all the time. Garda constantly attempted to shift the blame to another party. According to the US government, banks are required to keep meticulous track of customers' money, even if they outsource handling to another company. Although certain banks were storing money in Garda's vaults, it's technically still the bank's vault, and they must make sure it's operated in a safe and regulated manner. Recurring vault imbalances are considered risky by banks, but in the case of Garda, it's likely that several of their bank clients were unaware that the money they were seeing in audits wasn't theirs. Garda was fooling clients in a way that was only seen one other time with a company called Revere Armored. In the 90s, the Revere Armored case told a tale quite like Garda. They weren't telling banks that used its vaults that millions of dollars had gone missing. Revere sent banks fraudulent balance sheets and physically moved money between accounts to deceive auditors. The fraud came to light when a competitor of Revere's filmed Revere drivers leaving trucks unattended and tipped it off to the company's insurer. The insurer quickly dropped the company as a client and notified the FBI, who later uncovered the vault problem. The couple that owned Revere claimed to be victims of internal theft, but rather they had been stealing from clients to fund their personal gambling habit. The couple ended up in prison for bank fraud, but the attorney on that case argued that banks shared some fault for the disappearance of the money. Revere lost an estimated $35 million, and in the end, it was recommended that banks eat the losses. Despite the outlook of both Revere and Garda, all employees of these establishments weren't corrupt. In 2016, Garda's risk manager, Christine Buquin, sent an email to her supervisor detailing extensive safety problems at the company. Buquin also accused the company of misrepresenting Garda's financial condition. Garda set aside money to pay legal claims related to crashes and workers' compensation, but they had been manipulating these numbers to attain a better financial outlook. Buquin herself had been directed to manipulate the reserves to achieve whatever goal Garda had at the time. For instance, Buquin was instructed to increase the amount in reserves to make the company look worse just before Garda's owner, Stephen Crutchier, bought back the company's stock to take Garda private. She later was instructed to lower estimates in reserves to improve Garda's financial picture by millions. The day after Buquin sent the email to her supervisor, she was laid off. The company claimed that Buquin had a grudge against Garda World and even sued to have company documents returned. Since Garda's allegations against Buquin, she has become an outspoken critic of the company. Buquin revealed that she was given specific numbers to hit in order to keep reserves as low as possible, for as long as possible. Even with the wonky reserves that were constantly ordered to shift from high to low, the actual funds and reserves weren't sufficient to cover the severity of the incidents that occurred at Garda. A 2013 crash in Los Angeles left an aspiring nurse and Garda driver with permanent brain damage. Garda valued the case at $234,000, but the risk department believed it would cost between $2 million to $3 million. More incidents such as this occurred, emphasizing Garda's emphasis on maintaining their public image over being prepared in crisis. Who Quinn's anxiety around the company's actions were so heightened that she reached out to a senior claims consultant at Wells Fargo to ask for guidance. At the time, Wells Fargo was helping Garda manage its insurance policies. Buquin was honest with the Wells Fargo team and admitted her distress, but Wells Fargo did nothing more than remove references to Garda's methods of calculating reserves from the company's documents. Overall, the Garda World case was a fiasco, although Garda touts itself as a runaway success. Garda saw expansive growth in its formative years, and much of the growth came from acquisitions. However, these acquisitions were financed with huge amounts of debt. As concerns about Garda's ability to pay off debt grew, stock prices began to plummet. In 2012, Cretier took the company private alongside equity firm Apex Partners. Since Cretier's acquisition of Garda, the company has continued to expand, completing around 10 major acquisitions in 2018 and 2019 alone. Operating profits have grown steadily and significantly for the past six years. Despite surface-level success, Garda has failed to pay for basics necessary for simple operational costs. With Garda's poor or truck maintenance, lack of vault security, and overall apathetic attitude towards customer service, it's clear that the priority is making money, not spending it. At this time, Crecce has continued to applaud their acquisition of Garda, calling it a resounding success, despite facing multiple bankruptcies and scandal after scandal. In June of 2021, Crecce was awarded a $2 million bonus in acknowledgement of how well he runs the company.
What are a few of the saddest celebrity downfalls? Let's dive right in, starting with... Number four, Lonnie Willison. Lonnie Willison, once a successful swimwear and fitness model, found herself in a tragic situation, living on the streets. At 38 years old, she was virtually unrecognizable from her glamorous past as she wandered the streets, dragging her possessions along in a shopping cart and rummaging through dumpsters for food. Willison's attitude towards her living conditions seemed to be one of stubborn independence. Despite facing dire circumstances being homeless, she has resisted accepting help from friends, instead fending for herself on the streets. Her refusal to seek assistance implied that she made a conscious choice to maintain her current lifestyle. Willison's journey to this point began with a messy divorce from her ex-husband, Jeremy Jackson, a former child star known for his role as David Hasselhoff's son, Hobie, on Baywatch. Jeremy had a history of misusing substances, which ultimately led to the collapse of his marriage to Willison. At one point during their marriage, Lonnie claimed that Jeremy physically came after her, leaving her with injuries, but she chose not to press charges. Following the split, Lonnie's mental health deteriorated and she experienced a downward spiral. She lost her job, fell into debt, and eventually became homeless. She turned to illegal substances to cope with her emotional turmoil. During a 2018 interview, she admitted that she was in a lot of pain, but she couldn't live inside anywhere. She claimed to have severe electrophobia, which is fear of electricity. She said that this was caused by someone electrocuting her every day for nearly a year. Because of that, her body was holding on to the electrical charges, and she believed that it was responsible for her mental health issues. She used this electric charge in her body as an excuse for her substance abuse and said that taking substances was the only way to control it. Living on the streets, Lonnie faced constant danger and deprivation. She avoided showers and made herself as unappealing as possible to deter potential threats. Her life became a constant struggle for survival. Despite offers of help from friends, Lonnie rejected their assistance, preferring to stay on the streets and maintain her independence. Even when a model pal tried to get her off the streets and into rehab, she refused and disappeared for two years. A couple years later, she resurfaced, still homeless, and was seen digging through bins near Venice Beach, scavenging for clothing and food. Her once stunning looks were ravaged by her lifestyle, and she had lost several teeth. Meanwhile, her ex-husband Jeremy Jackson had managed to stay clean and reinvent himself himself as a leading figure in LA's fitness scene, but he refused to comment on Lonnie's situation and appeared to be completely unaffected by her circumstances. Number three, Lisa Marie Presley. Lisa Marie Presley, the only child of the legendary rock and roll icon Elvis Presley and his wife Priscilla, was born in 1968 and grew up in the shadow of her father's immense fame. She was just nine years old when Elvis passed away in 1977, leaving her his entire estate in a trust. At the time of his passing, Elvis was reportedly worth only $5 million, which isn't what you'd expect from someone like Elvis. But thanks to Priscilla's savvy business decisions, the value of his estate bloomed. By the time Lisa Marie was 25 and able to take over the trust and estate, Priscilla had grown it to be worth over $100 million. However, as Lisa Marie's life progressed, she became embroiled in legal and financial battles. Her tragic passing left unresolved issues over her finances, including a bitter custody battle with her fourth and final husband, Michael Lockwood. Lockwood saw an insane $40,000 a month in child support, while Lisa Marie claimed to be $16 million in debt due to disastrous business deals made by her business manager, Barry Siegel. Lisa Marie and Lockwood's divorce was particularly ugly, with both parties making serious allegations against each other. Lockwood, the father of their twin daughters, Harper, Vivian, and Finley, insisted that Lisa Marie had a lot more money than she said she did. Lisa Marie's financial situation was further complicated by her association with Barry Siegel, who had been managing her finances since 2003. In 2005, Siegel advised her to sell off 85% 
percent of her share in Elvis Presley Enterprises, which led to her losing control of her father's names and image rights. Lisa Marie later sued Siegel, accusing him of mismanaging her finances and placing her money in risky ventures in hopes of attaining his own celebrity in the entertainment industry. Siegel billed Lisa $4.9 million to manage the trust between 2005 and the time of the American Idol bankruptcy in 2016, averaging an annual salary of $701,000 per year. The trust was left in a precarious financial situation, with mortgages on properties in Hawaii and Hidden Hills, California, both exceeding their worth, and an English estate transaction that left the trust in default. Lisa Marie's debts were substantial, including more than $10 million owed in back taxes from 2012 to 2017, and defaulting on her debt of more than $6 million from her United Kingdom home. She also owed over $260,000 in professional fees, over $47,000 in credit card debt, and an estimated $250,000 in miscellaneous unpaid bills. While Lisa Marie faced accusations of out-of-control spending, her lawyers argued that Siegel had misled her about the true state of her finances. Despite her financial struggles, Lisa Marie also battled personal demons and had gone to rehab multiple times. Lisa Marie's childhood was filled with luxuries and extravagances, as Elvis indulged her every chance he got with ponies, private access to amusement parks, and staff at her beck and call. Growing up with such wealth gave Lisa Marie a taste of the finer things, which may account for any of her alleged out-of-control spending. Luckily, Priscilla proved to be a business genius after Elvis's passing, turning Graceland into a global tourist attraction and capitalizing on merchandising and royalties from unreleased songs. Elvis himself faced his own share of financial problems, as his manager, Colonel Tom Parker, had previously sold off his royalties for very little. Only $1.35 million of that money ever went to Elvis, leaving the estate in dire financial straits until Priscilla turned it around. Over the years, Lisa Marie bought and sold several properties, including a 15th century manor house in England and a home in Calabasas, California. Tragically, her son, Benjamin Key, passed away in 2020 in the Calabasas home, adding to an already complicated and tragic life story. The mismanagement of her portfolio by Siegel and the bitter divorce from Lockwood, along with other financial troubles, left Lisa Marie's finances in shambles at the time of her demise. She was only 54 years old and is survived by her twins, Harper and Finley Lockwood. The legal and financial battles surrounding her estate have raised questions about how Lisa Marie managed to lose the $100 million fortune left to her by her father. Despite the challenges Lisa Marie faced in her life, she was still in sole possession of Elvis's estate, which is thought to be worth tens of millions of dollars and could have potentially covered any of her outstanding debts. Her legacy and the iconic music of her father will continue to be remembered and cherished by fans worldwide. Number two, Brett Butler. Brett Butler, a comedian and actress best known for her starring role in the 90s ABC sitcom Grace Under Fire, has faced financial struggles that led her to turn to a GoFundMe campaign for help. Butler had found herself six months behind on her rent, facing imminent eviction from her Los Angeles apartment. Once a prominent figure in the entertainment industry, Butler's life took a downturn after the abrupt cancellation of her hit sitcom and a battle with misusing substances. Butler had confided in her close friend, blogger Ron Strickland, about her dire circumstances. Strickler suggested launching a GoFundMe campaign, which Butler initially hesitated to accept, concerned about potential backlash. However, after Strickler convinced her that she shouldn't fear what haters might say, they set a goal of $15,000. The campaign has been successful, raising over $25,000 from 246 donors, providing a temporary respite from Butler's financial woes. Brett Butler's rise to fame began when she was discovered doing stand-up in New York City during the mid 1980s. 80s. She quickly gained attention for her comedic talent and southern charm. Her big break came with the sitcom Grace Under Fire, in which she portrayed a recovering alcoholic single mother raising three children. The show became a hit, and at its peak, Butler was earning an impressive $250,000 per episode. During her time on Grace Under Fire, Butler struggled with misusing substances, leading to her strange behavior on set. This led to tensions with the show's creator and resulted in the show's abrupt cancellation during its fifth season. Despite 
earning a substantial fortune of $25 million during her time on the sitcom, Butler squandered it on what she described as wasteful spending and financial carelessness. After her sitcom days, Butler faced a challenging period in her life, moving back to Georgia and buying a farm that she eventually lost due to financial difficulties. But a chance encounter with Charlie Sheen, of all people, in 2012 changed her life once again. Sheen, no stranger to his own controversies, fought to get Butler a role in his sitcom Anger Management, which provided her with some much-needed financial stability. Despite landing smaller acting roles in popular shows like How to Get Away with Murder, The Leftovers, and The Walking Dead, Butler's income significantly declined from her Grace Under Fire days. You'd think that roles on such popular shows would make many of her problems go away, and they kind of did, but one day shoots earned her just over the Screen Actors Guild minimum wage, which is roughly $5,000 per shoot. It wasn't peanuts, but it was a pretty far cry from her previous earnings. Facing financial hardships and inspired by her successful GoFundMe campaign, Butler has considered a return to her comedic roots. She contemplated getting back into stand-up comedy where she initially found fame and success. The prospect of revisiting her comedic talents has given her hope for a potential comeback, but only time will tell. Number 1. Maia Campbell Maia Campbell is an actress who gained fame in the 1990s for her role as Tiffany Warren in the hit sitcom In the House, alongside LL Cool J and Debbie Allen. However, despite her initial success, Maia's life took a turbulent turn marked by mental health struggles that deeply impacted her career and personal life. In 1998, Maia was diagnosed with bipolar disorder after a bout of erratic behavior on the set of her show. Her life took a downward spiral as she grappled with the challenges of her mental health condition. After after giving birth to her daughter in 2000, Maia stopped taking her medication, ultimately leading to the loss of custody of her child. Her battle with bipolar disorder, combined with her struggles in the entertainment industry, led her to seek solace in contraband, resulting in several arrests and a harrowing public meltdown. Over the years, Maia Campbell's condition worsened and her mental health struggles became evident to the public through disturbing videos of her appearing disheveled and behaving erratically. Concerned fans and friends, including renowned life coach Jan La Van Zandt, attempted to help her by offering support and a platform to share her story. In 2012, Jan La Van Zandt took on the task of fixing Maia's life in a celebrity edition of her show, Jan La Fix My Life. The episode shed light on Maia's struggles, revealing her two-year journey to sobriety while still grappling with bipolar disorder. Despite the challenges, Campbell showed resilience and a willingness to confront her demons. After the episode, she was spotted in the East Atlanta area, once again raising concerns about her well-being. A video that surfaced depicted her looking disheveled and seemingly under the influence. While her journey has been marked by hardships, Maia Campbell's story also serves as a reminder of the importance of mental health awareness and support. These stories all serve as a reminder that, despite their fame and immense wealth, celebrities are still just people. Jim Carrey once said that he wanted everyone to get rich and famous and have everything they ever dreamed of so they could see that it isn't the answer. These people did have it all and lost it because they still weren't happy. So maybe he's right. What are some of the strangest things people lie about? Let's get right to it with... Number six, celebrating celebrations. A strange and hysterical anonymous woman in Los Angeles ran into a local store saying she had won a lottery jackpot, causing a stir of excitement in the community. The Powerball jackpot had reached $1.08 billion, making it the third largest prize in the game's history. The woman's reaction to her apparent windfall took a surprising twist when it was revealed that she actually hadn't won anything. Her reaction was caught on camera as she she walked into Las Palmitas Mini Mart, a small bodega in East LA, where the winning ticket was sold. The video went viral and was featured on local news channel KTLA, putting the spotlight on her ridiculous celebration and tearful proclamation of winning the life-changing sum. The store owner, neighbor Herrera, was surprised his store had sold the winning ticket and was unaware of the momentous event until reporters gathered outside his shop. The unexpected revelation took a twist when Sere Palacios, the granddaughter of the bodega's owner, stepped forward to clarify that the woman was, in fact, not the real winner. The news left the community a bit puzzled since the ticket was indeed sold at the store. That meant Palacio's family was in line for their own significant windfall of $1 million, a reward for selling the winning ticket. With plans to use the money for a luxurious vacation and a college fund, the Palacio's family's fortune took an unexpectedly positive turn. During her celebration, the woman's distinctive black cap emblazoned with the words, 
psychedelic water drew attention, possibly adding a bit of an explanation for the bizarre display. Her tears of joy and claims of victory were met with confusion when it was revealed that the real winner was still yet to come forward. The woman's demeanor then shifted from elation to a sudden realization, prompting her to flee the scene. As cameras pursued her, she hurriedly ran down the street and eventually jumped into a dark BMW, leaving behind a crowd of curious onlookers. Maybe she was looking for her little 15 minutes of fame, or maybe it really was an honest mistake. Either way, her celebration was likely pretty far from the strangest thing people saw that day in East LA. She'll always be a winner in our hearts though. Number five, extended stay hotel. And Kush Duta managed to turn a one night reservation into an almost two year luxurious stay at a five star hotel in Delhi, India. What began as a simple overnight booking at the Rosita house hotel evolved into a 603 night stay all without settling a bill that amassed over seventy thousand dollars duta was accused of intentionally skipping out on the considerable bill leaving the hotel wondering how in the world he was even able to get away with it for so long but then allegations emerged that hotel staff might have been involved in helping duta evade his bill it's been suggested that the hotel's employees played an active role in enabling duta's prolonged stay through various acts of forgery manipulation. The staff's alleged complicity included falsifying a significant number of entries under Duta's name, manipulating account records, and incorporating his name into other guests' bills. The intricate and deliberate nature of these actions showed a clear effort to protect Duta from detection. However, despite the ongoing investigation and the mounting evidence against Duta and the involved staff members, no arrests have been made as of yet. Why everyone was so into helping this guy is anyone's guess. And seriously, how dumb was management at this place. The guy stays there for two years for free and they're like, we think he had help from someone on the inside. Great detective work, guys, yet there's still so many unsolved crimes. Number four, let's talk about it. In a slimy move, the owner of the California Tequila chain, basically a taco stand, Shay Garibaldi, orchestrated a scheme that involved hiring a fake man of God to deceive and manipulate his employees. The operation, which aimed to extract confessions of workplace sins from his staff, resulted in revelations that shed light on a series of labor violations. The fake priest coerced employees of Tequila Garibaldi to reveal any sins they may have committed within the workplace. The goal was to gather information about potential wrongdoing, such as theft, tardiness, or actions that could potentially harm the employer. In fact, the fake priest seemed to really only care about sins committed on the job, because he wasn't actually a priest. But Garibaldi's paranoia brought forth an investigation by the Department of Labor, and the investigation unveiled a shocking trail of unethical behavior by Garibaldi. Alongside the use of the fake priest, Garibaldi had also denied employees rightful overtime pay for hours worked beyond the 40-hour mark, violating the Fair Labor Standards Act. Furthermore, managers were paid from the employee's tip pool, which is a bit odd that the managers were okay with this. And in what seems to be a strong push for world's worst boss, Garibaldi actually threatened employees with retaliation by calling immigration if the employees cooperated with any investigations by the Department of Labor. He even terminated an employee who he thought reported him to the department. As a result of the comprehensive investigation, Garibaldi and his enterprise were held accountable. The U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of California California ordered Che Garibaldi and its owners and operators Eduardo Hernandez, Hector Manuel Martinez Galindo, and Alejandro Rodriguez to pay a total of $140,000 in back wages and damages. The ruling also dictated that the defendants cease any attempts to hinder employees from asserting their rights or interfere with investigations, which seems a little superfluous, but whatever. It makes you wonder if any of the employees fell for the ruse, and if they did, what kind of penance did the fake priest give? You showed up late and stole some food? Uh, say uh, 20 Hail Marys and then work an extra 40 hours for free. Number three, imitation isn't the sincerest form of flattery. Shelby Hewitt's story unfolded like an unsettling puzzle that left both students and parents at Boston High Schools baffled and disturbed. The 32-year-old social worker allegedly posed as a teenage student for an entire academic year. Hewitt's charade 
began when she enrolled in the Jeremiah E. Burke High School, introducing herself to her classmates as Daniela. Her seemingly quiet demeanor led to her befriending fellow students, like 15-year-old Janelle Lamons, who felt a sense of camaraderie with the new student. Lamons described Daniela as really smart and said that she regularly helped classmates with math problems. Hewitt even joined the school's basketball team, where she chose 32 for her number, which was also her age. Over the course of the academic year, Hewitt managed to attend three Boston public schools, including the Burke, Brighton, and English high schools. She went by different aliases in each school, further complicating her true identity. Hewitt used her background as a social worker to take advantage of her knowledge of how to exploit foster care regulations. By claiming to be a foster child, Hewitt bypassed the documentation requirements and was immediately accepted to the schools. Hewitt's roommates allegedly helped her by posing as her parents in documents she'd forged for proof of being a foster child. Suspicion eventually grew as students and faculty began to question Hewitt's changing stories. She would often provide varying explanations for her circumstances, such as her parents dying from an overdose, to her father being in prison, and even her claiming to be an immigrant from Colombia. Furthermore, her appearance raised eyebrows, as she dressed too maturely for her age and drove a car that was a little too nice to school. The unraveling of Hewitt's story began when administrators at English High School discovered inconsistencies in her paperwork. A closer examination revealed documents filled with misspellings and incorrect information. Hewitt's ruse was finally exposed, and she was charged with forgery and identity theft. No one really knows why she did what she did, but if she's convicted, Hewitt could face a potential prison sentence. Once you're out of high school for 10 plus years, it's probably not that unusual to wonder if you'd be any more successful with a little more experience under your belt. It is just creepy and weird to actually do it though. Number two, the Trump card. Joshua Hall, a Trump supporter from Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, operated a series of fake Twitter accounts where he impersonated various members of the Trump family. Hall managed to fool not only the general public, but even the former president himself, Donald Trump. Hall's ruse began when he adopted the persona of political figures and their family members on Twitter, amassing over 160,000 followers across multiple accounts. He posed as Robert Trump, the president's brother, Baron Trump, the president's teenage son, and Dr. Deborah L. Burks, the White House Coronavirus Response Coordinator. Hall's most successful account was the one he made of Elizabeth Trump Grau, Trump's sister. He posted tweets as Elizabeth, endorsing the idea of overturning the election, and Trump actually responded with, thank you, Elizabeth, love. Although Hall's personas achieved considerable success in terms of followers and interactions, his real life was marked by a string of short-lived jobs, including delivering food for DoorDash. Despite the inflammatory nature of his posts, Hall argued that they were merely parody accounts a claim that gained some credibility due to the disclaimers he put in his bios. One of Hall's more influential accounts was the one he made of Robert Trump. Hall, playing as Robert Trump, ran a political group that supposedly advocated for LGBTQ plus Trump supporters. He started a GoFundMe advertising the group's designation, making a total of $7,384 in donations, so it was moderately successful. According to Hall, the money remained with GoFundMe, but a GoFundMe spokesperson said that the organizer of the fundraiser operating under the name Josh H. had indeed withdrawn the funds. GoFundMe acknowledged launching an investigation to determine how the money had been utilized and emphasized their commitment to refunding any donors who wanted their donations back. Some of Hall's posts stood out for their controversial content. His comments ranged from spreading conspiracy theories, such as claiming that the government planned to implant microchips in Americans, to promoting outlandish notions like JFK Jr. was alive and that he was going to replace Mike Pence Hence is vice president. However, Hall's online escapades eventually caught up with him and he was arrested on charges of wire fraud and identity theft. The charges against Hall carry significant potential consequences. Wire fraud could lead to a maximum sentence of 20 years in prison and the identity theft charges could result in two years of imprisonment. And like it or not, anytime we've ever read one of Trump's tweets, it's always in his voice. Thank you, Elizabeth. Love. Number one, boys don't cry. Georgia Billum, 21, was recently found guilty after an eight-day trial for when she pretended to be a boy and got into a relationship with another female whose identity remains anonymous by law. The case centered around Billum's creation of an online persona, George Perry, whom she used to fool the victim. Billum went to great lengths to maintain her illusion, using online platforms such as Snapchat to create and reinforce the persona. Wearing a navy blue hoodie and maintaining a consistent facade, Billum managed to convince the victim that she was interacting with 
with a dude. The victim, who severely short-sighted, eventually entered into a complex love-hate relationship with George. As the relationship between Billum and the victim progressed, the victim said she truly believed she was engaging with a young man. Their relationship evolved into a complex mixture of affection and animosity. But the scam eventually crumbled when the victim's mother grew suspicious and figured it out. George wasn't a boy. The victim then took it upon herself to investigate George's true identity through social media, leading her to uncover the elaborate deception. Of course, the police were called and Georgia was arrested. During the trial, Billum offered several explanations for her actions. She admitted that she had created the persona as a means of escaping her own lack of confidence and self-esteem. Billum's legal team contended that both parties were aware of the true nature of their relationship, even though she deceived the victim about her gender. During the trial, Billum's defense team also claimed that the victim was aware of Billum's gender and that they shared a mutual love-hate relationship marked by toxicity and complexity. Ultimately, the jury only found Billum guilty of one charge out of 16, specifically pertaining to a single incident. Because of YouTube censorship and demonetization and the fact that we still need to pay a few bills around here, we're gonna have to call it an aggressive kiss that wasn't wanted. But you know what we really mean. The judge deferred sentencing to a later date during which Billum's fate will be determined. She was added to that famous registry no one wants to be on, and the judge underscored that a custodial sentence was a potential outcome. Tony Shea became an incredibly rich man by selling his startup, Link Exchange, to Microsoft for $265 million and his shoe company, Zappos, to Amazon for $1.2 billion. Shea was known for his incredible generosity and unusual business practices. And like most incredibly wealthy people, Shea grew a cult-like following of yes-men and enablers. Shea had started out revolutionizing corporate culture, but eventually began self-medicating to deal with his anxiety. But self-medicating never works out, and Shea worked his way up to inhaling up to 50 small canisters of laughing gas daily, becoming reclusive and detached from reality. Shea became convinced that he was able to download skills directly to his brain, like Neo from the Matrix and that he had the ability to turn into animals. One day, Shea was found on his property, sitting by a lake totally emaciated, rambling to 90s icon Jewel about hacking sleep, not needing to eat, and having an algorithm for world peace. Inside his mansion, literally hundreds of candles were burning with wax and dog feces littering the floor and clear instructions not to clean up either. Obviously, his friend was concerned. When she finally left, Jewel warned the head of security that if Shay passed in a huge fire and took everyone in the house with him, they couldn't say they weren't warned. As the founder of Zappos, Tony Shea didn't just sell shoes. He transformed the way people shopped and connected with brands. Zappos' motto, create fun and a little weirdness, perfectly stated the values of the company. The offices were a burst of color, creativity, and whimsy. Leading the charge was Tony Shea, the embodiment of a special kind of CEO. With an umbrella twirling in hand, dressed in jeans and a Zappos branded t-shirt, he guided visitors through the vibrant workspaces. Under Shea's leadership, Zappos Zappos' ascent was nothing short of remarkable. Taking the reins soon after its inception, he guided the company from near collapse after the dot-com bust to a billion-dollar acquisition by Amazon in 2009. Jeff Bezos, in a video message to Zappos employees during the acquisition, praised the company's unique culture and brand, emphasizing his commitment to preserving these invaluable assets. Shea's impact extended beyond the confines of Zappos. He envisioned a transformation of downtown Las Vegas into a second Silicon Valley, investing $350 million of his own money to infuse the area with creativity and innovation. He aimed to replicate the strange and alternative culture of Burning Man, a festival he frequented each summer. In 2014, Shea embarked on an experiment, implementing what he called a holacracy. This radical management structure aimed to decentralize organizations, empower self-managed teams, and eliminate traditional hierarchies. The shift was monumental, replacing bosses with self-management and introducing Producing new rules and titles. With a fortune nearing $1 billion, Shea spared no expense in ensuring that every Zappos worker felt valued and cherished. The company allocated millions of dollars annually for extravagant parties, family gatherings, and happy hours, all orchestrated by a dedicated team known as the Fun Engineers. These events transform Las Vegas nightclubs into circus-like spectacles or immersive movie replicas, showcasing Shea's commitment to fostering an atmosphere of fun and excitement. In 
2016, Shay's path crossed with that of folk singer Jewel, known for her 90s hits Foolish Games and You Were Meant For Me, who had transformed her tumultuous upbringing into a journey of self-discovery and mental health advocacy. Shay's connection with Jewel was immediate, leading him to approach her with a unique proposition, develop a program at Zappos that would address stress and mental health, preparing employees for the demands of the holacracy system he had introduced. It became apparent that Shay's interest in mental health went beyond Zappos' workforce. Jewel's team recognized that Shay himself was grappling with issues of social anxiety and stress management. As the pressures of his skyrocketing fame and responsibilities mounted, Shay struggled to navigate his own well-being. He sought solace in an Italian liqueur, Fernet, drinking it throughout the day. Jules' collaboration with Shea extended beyond the workplace. His participation in the program she developed remained indirect. He sought book recommendations about mental health and engaged in deeper discussions on the topic. However, as Jules delved into more intensive retreats and workshops aimed at addressing personal struggles, Shea's presence dwindled. Shea's trajectory during the pandemic was marred by a tragic descent. As he embraced a party-centric lifestyle at his new mansion in Park City, Utah, it became a haven for a plethora of guests ranging from actors and artists to government officials. Shay's ambitions stretched beyond the ordinary, with a desire to solve world peace driving his interactions. Yet, his wild parties and gatherings also served as a backdrop to his struggle with addiction and deteriorating mental health. These gatherings, characterized by extravagant celebrations, also underscored the widening gap between Shay's reputation as a visionary leader and the mounting challenge challenges he faced in his personal life. Shea experimented with various illegal substances and pushed his boundaries to the extreme by attempting to forego sleep, oxygen, and even food, resulting in his weight dropping below 100 pounds. The disintegration of his well-being was evident to those close to him, with friends noting things were falling apart. As his health faltered, Shea's life took on an almost cult-like dimension, with him being perceived as both a Howard Hughes-like figure and a cult leader. He accumulated properties under the name Pickled Investments, reflecting his lavish lifestyle that included purchasing condos for friends and investing in various businesses, even offering down payments for future meals at local restaurants. Tony Shea's personal assistant, Mimi Pham, emerged as a central figure with a controversial role. Pham, often referred to as Shea's right-hand person, had become an integral part of his world, overseeing crucial aspects of his life. Initially paid a flat rate of $9,000 per month, along with travel expenses, Pham's compensation quickly escalated. By 2020, her pay surged to $30,000 a month, accompanied by a 10% commission on any funds she managed or invested on Shay's behalf. This commission spanned an astonishing array of areas, leading to a multi-million dollar increase in her income over a single year. Pham's influence extended far beyond financial management. She reportedly engaged in an envious feud with another of Shay's associates, Susie Bailson, who was also receiving commissions. To counter this, Pham drafted a peculiar contract stipulating that she would be paid $30,000 for every day Bailson spent on Shay's property. Beyond questionable financial dealings, Pham allegedly crossed boundaries by monitoring Shay against his wishes through a camera installed in his bedroom. This intrusion into his personal space showed a deeper level of control that had manifested. One of the most shocking allegations revolved around Pham's involvement in securing a $10 million contract for documentary projects. The contract purportedly benefited her boyfriend, Roberto Grande, a lawyer. Under the terms, the profits were funneled through a company owned by Pham and Grande, allowing them to take a significant cut. Amidst these challenges, a critical turning point emerged in February 2020 when Shay's friends intervened, persuading him to seek help in a rehab facility. This decision was an attempt to break the cycle of his self-destructive behavior, catalyzed in part by his associates in Las Vegas who had been fueling his addictions. Although Shay embarked on this journey towards recovery, the aftermath of his rehab stint revealed that his inner demon still held a grip on his psyche. By May, Shay had developed delusions of possessing psychic abilities and the capacity to levitate. In an effort to restore his sense of well-being, his close friends organized a therapeutic bus trip to a ranch in Montana. Shay boarded the bus wearing nothing but pajama pants and clutching a box of crayons. He stark contrast to his previous self. His transformation was evident in his penchant for conducting meetings clad only in underwear, a behavior he had never exhibited before. Shay's vulnerability became evident through his actions during this period. He offered exorbitant sums of money to friends for seemingly trivial tasks while under the influence of hallucinogens. The bus ride to Montana unraveled.
unravel into a nightmarish episode. Shay's mind, distorted by the effects of the contraband he'd been taking, led him to believe he was trapped in an active shooter situation, prompting him to physically destroy his beloved tour bus. Even more disturbingly, he proposed a pact to his friends, suggesting that he would set the bus ablaze with everyone inside. As 2020 progressed, Tony Shay's life was spiraling into the abyss, marked by a mix of obsessions and manic visions. His downward trajectory reached a disturbing climax as he experimented with various substances and indulged in behaviors that signaled his increasing detachment from reality. Shay's addictions had spiraled out of control, and he began inhaling a gas known for producing momentary euphoria. This shift was accompanied by a dangerous fascination with fire, leading him to play with fire and perform risky magic tricks involving candles, even placing them precariously on his bedspread. His room was adorned with over a thousand candles, and a small fire ring shot flames into the air without restraint. The mansion itself mirrored his tumultuous mental state. When Jewel and her team visited in August, they were confronted with an astonishing sight. The property was in disarray, with hundreds of candles causing wax to drip onto furniture, carpets, and countertops. Shay's small terrier mix, Blizzy, had left droppings intertwined with wax throughout the space. Signs explicitly instructed visitors not to clean up, reflecting Shay's unconventional philosophy that discarding trash contributed to environmental harm. The mansion was a reflection of his belief in living in harmony with nature, a sentiment reinforced by leaving showers and sinks running constantly to mimic the sounds of waterfalls. Brightly colored sticky notes replaced electronic communication plastered on walls, glass doors, and windows. The property became a microcosm of his struggles, as even basic amenities were reimagined in bizarre ways. A stream that once flowed naturally was rerouted to the patio, repurposed to serve as a so-called natural dishwasher. The luxury of electricity gave way to an ethereal landscape of hundreds of candles and tiki torches, a spectacle that triggered concerns among local authorities. The nocturnal ambiance was marked by the constant chime of smoke alarms. In the midst of this surreal reality, the mansion bore witness to incidents that reflected Shay's escalating instability. In one episode, Shay accidentally cut his foot on glass. Instead of tending to his wound, he chose to walk around the house. This gesture seemed to symbolize his quest for connection, even through pain. As his mental and physical health plummeted, the mansion became a battleground for Shay's relationships and finances. The Shay family's lawsuit indicated that Pham began asserting control over his assets, claiming he was running out of money and imposing the idea of charging rent at his properties with a 10% commission for herself. Even Shay's own brother was locked out of his own house, coerced into paying rent against his wishes. Friends and family intervened, pleading with Pham to take action before it was too late. The Shay family's lawsuit alleged that a close friend implored Pham, acknowledging that Tony was on the brink of passing away. However, Pham's response was chilling, a dismissal of his impending fate, viewing him as an adult with the autonomy to make his own choices, regardless of the recklessness they entailed. Jewel's visit exposed the extent of Shay's deteriorating mental health. She found him outdoors by a small lake, sitting in a lawn chair with only his boxers on. His skeletal appearance was striking as he sat surrounded by many gas canisters he'd been inhaling. In a moment of urgency, Shay revealed a box containing a seemingly random series of numbers, which he claimed was an algorithm for achieving world peace, a manic vision that hinted at his distorted mental state. Shay's revelations continued. He declared his intent to start a new country and proclaimed that he had hacked sleep, no longer needing it. Jewel recognized that Shay's visions weren't merely eccentric ideas. There were cries for help from someone grappling with a severe mental health crisis. At the mansion, Jewel confronted the troubling atmosphere and those around Shay who seemed indifferent to his deteriorating condition. She questioned their purpose and their seeming lack of concern. Despite the deplorable state of the property and Shay's obvious distress, most individuals around him treated his behavior as normal, a sentiment possibly encouraged by Shay himself. He had told his new employees that he was undergoing a creative metamorphosis and that his sobriety would be the final stage. Jewel's parting words to the property's new head of security revealed the gravity of the situation. She warned that if Shay's destructive behavior continued unchecked, it would end in disaster. Tony Shay's journey reached an end as he succumbed to injuries sustained in a fire at his residence in New London, Connecticut. On that fateful day, first responders rushed to the scene of a blazing three-story beachfront home, shrouded in darkness at 3.30 a.m. The residents bore witness to a storage shed where dark smoke emanated, marking the origin of the fire. With 
Within this tumultuous scene, a somber connection to Shea's recent struggles emerged. Witnesses told the first responders that Mr. Shea was in the shed, prompting a frantic effort to break down the door and quell the flames. The language used by the responders painted a grim picture, one of a man barricaded within. It was a scenario that bore unsettling resonance to the prior warning by Jewel. The fire's aftermath revealed the true extent of the situation. Mr. Shea had been rescued from the blaze, with first responders undertaking life-saving efforts as they performed CPR on him. He was subsequently transported to the Connecticut Burn Center in Bridgeport, where his fight for survival continued. Despite the medical team's best efforts, Shea's condition deteriorated, and he ultimately passed away. When reflecting on Tony Shea's final moments, it's crucial to approach them with compassion and empathy. His struggles with addiction, mental health, and the search for meaning had clearly taken a toll on his well-being. We all have at least one person in our lives struggling with one of those things. And as is often the case with the supremely wealthy, they find themselves surrounded by people who are also more interested in what they can get rather than how they can help, like Mimi Pham. Shay's breakdown was enabled by the people who were around him, and despite his clear need for help, he never truly got it. He just got stuck with people who only said, okay boss, whatever you want to do. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comments section which website you spend the most time online shopping other than Amazon.